Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, ex sunt leones, uh, letting people say this is really a peculiar argument, it's, uh, it's very difficult. And if we see the result of mitral plasty in normal population, this is very well uh, a paper published by Carpentier, the results are outstanding. You, say, you can see at 10 years, 91% of the patients are free from uh, adverse event. But this is an organic uh, uh, mitral problem. Completely different issue if we uh, uh, concentrate our attention to functional uh, mitral regurgitation. That it's completely different uh, issue because we know that chronic ischemic mitral uh, occurs in uh, approximately 30% of patients followed up after myocardial infarction and 50% of those with post-infarct congestive heart failure. Chronic ischemic mitral regurgitation, adverse prognosis, doubling mortality after myocardial infarction and cardiac failure. We know the mechanism is still controversial. The complex interaction of various determinants, a lot of solution to single problem. However, it's likely that no one of them work well. A rate of recurrence are published up to 30%. So, uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation is a ventricular disease. The volume overload created by mitral regurgitation add a greater pathological burden in already adverse condition. Or simply, the worst prognosis is related to a poor left ventricle function and mitral regurgitation is merely an indicator of this bad condition. This is a, a very elegant editorial that was published two years, uh, last year. And uh, the author said the valve and uh, uh, papillary muscle are merely accomplishing the crime. The primary culprit region is the underlying ventricular infarction and adverse remodeling. So it is important to have a definition of what is uh, uh, mitral regurgitation, ischemic mitral regurgitation. We are speaking of mitral regurgitation that is not determined by transient, transient ischemia. If we, cur if we uh, uh, avoid ischemia, for example with angioplasty or with coronary bypass, the mitral regurgitation disappears. We are speaking about a mitral regurgitation that is not uh, uh, reduced by a good flow in involved coronaries. So the, the real mitral ischemic regurgitation is the situation that we can see after an acute myocardial infarction. This is a very, I'm sorry, this is a very uh, old uh, cartoon, but can give us a good idea of what happens if there is an occlusion of the left anterior descending. We can have a really different situation, oops, sorry, According with the extension of the infarction, we can have a small dilatation, but if you have a big anterior apical inferior infarction, the dilatation of the left ventricle with the anterior infarction become big, and also the papillary muscle, the base of the papillary muscle is involved, and the position of the papillary muscle is changed completely, and the orientation is toward the lateral wall. This determines a systolic retraction of the posterior leaf of the mitral valve, determine the mitral regurgitation. So in this cartoon, it's clear that the valve is perfect normal in terms of leaflet, cordae, and papillary muscle. What is normal is the position of the papillary muscle. This is an example of different dilatation that can uh, be present after an anterior myocardial infarction. You see that we can start from this condition that is classical left ventricle aneurysm to arrive to that, that is dilated cardiomyopathy, but the disease is exactly the same, and the, the vessel that is involved is exactly the same, the left anterior descending. This is the four chamber view, and this is the two chamber view, exactly the same thing. You can see clearly that in this particular case, we have big ventricle back the jet of fraction, but this zone where the papillary muscle insists it's, uh, it's doing very well, and in effort, the, the, the valve is its perfect continent. In that situation, 
the base of the left ventricle, the, the wall of the left ventricle, it doesn't move towards the inner the cavity, and the papillary muscle is retracted towards the lateral wall and towards the external portion of the ventricle. And the valve is leaking because the tenting area is increased. So this was uh, demonstrated by different authors. In 2005, Levine showed clearly that the mitral, uh, regurg ischemic mitral regurgitation is determined by infarction that is involved in the infralateral wall. More recently, Clear demonstrated that if the anterior infarction involves more than four segments of the left ventricle, also the valve is involved because this portion of the, le of the left ventricle is involved. So we can have this type of situation with involvement of the uh, uh, muscle between the two papillary muscles in this way, or we can involve the septum that is involved partially the uh, medial papillary muscle. In the, in the end, uh, we have these three diameters that are involved, the distance between the papillary muscle, the, the distance between the head of the papillary muscle to the annulus, and the diameter of the annulus. All the trees, uh, all these trees uh, parameters are enlarged in uh, uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation. We know that to treat functional mitral regurgitation is uh, more difficult because the, the ventricle is involved, but is it difficult because also the, the shape of the ventricle is, is different. In effect, we can have big ventricle, either for reason uh, ischemic or for uh, a <coughs> parametric dilatative cardiomyopathy, big, but with no mitral regurgitation. Because in these two situations, the elliptic shape of the ventricle is still preserved. In that condition, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a situation with the same volumes, there is the mitral regurgitation because this diameter, the transverse diameter, is increased and the position of the papillary muscle is, uh, is uh, wrong. The result that we have treated this pathology are relatively disappointing. The first one is very often we have recurrence of mitral regurgitation. And in this very well-known paper published uh, 10 years ago from the uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, group, see that during the first six months after repair, the proportion of patients with zero or plus one mitral regurgitation decreased from 70% to 40%, for, whereas the proportion with three plus and four plus regurgitation increased from 13 to 28%. Small annuloplasty size did not influence postoperative regurgitation. Annuloplasty type was not associated with survival, and this is another important issue. In this other paper, it was clearly demonstrated that if you treat the mitral regurgitation with cabbage and mitral plasty, you can improve the uh, symptoms of the patient but we do not improve survival. And this is one, another demonstration that the ventricle in this type of pathology is deeply involved. There is a great debate concerning the best treatment of this pathology and which result can be expected. All authors agree that in the presence of very delight ventricle, the mid-term result of mitral repair are doubtful. For this reason, Robert Dion suggests that if the short axis of the ventricle is bigger than 60, something must to be done on the ventricle to try to reduce this diameter. Calafiore was strike. If deep of the tenting area is more than 10, the valve should be replaced. This is the, the paper from uh, Dion that shows clearly that 65 is a cutoff to try to repair or to do other something beside that. This is the result of the paper that we published some years ago in which we analyzed patients that were treated with reconstruction of left ventricle and that they, and that, uh, they have before the procedure uh, uh, MR plus two. And the, the mitral in this group of the patient was not treated. We had 75% uh, of the patient that after the procedure, the mitral valve was beautiful working but we have 25% in which the mitral valve still was leaking. 
which were the difference of these two groups of the patient because the surgeon was the same well the difference were that the ejection fraction pre-op was different was very low in the patient that keep the mitral insufficiency after and was relative better 35 percent in the patient that have the mitral regurgitation cured by the uh, surgery on the ventricle. But in the post-operative period, you see that there is a huge difference between the, the volume that are achieved in the patient with no mitral regurgitation, the volume are smaller, and the patient with uh, present, still present of mitral regurgitation, the volume are bigger. And if you see the diameters that are achieved in the two population are completely different. When the mitral is, uh, is uh, fixed, the diameter is below 65. When the mitral is still leaking, the diameter is bigger than 70. This is an interesting paper published uh, uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, a group of the patients uh, with mitral regurgitation were treated with uh, um, mitral valve anulplasty. And what is, was interesting that there is a group, 88 patients, in which there is no recurrence, and there is another group in which the mitral valve uh, insufficiency was present again. And which are the difference of the two groups? Because the baseline characteristics are exactly the same. Are the results achieved in the post-operative? You see that the volume are bigger in the group with uh, the present of uh, um, uh, mitral regurgitation. You see there is 201 against 159 and 110 against 150. So this difference in volume brings a recurrence of mitral regurgitation. And if we compare, that is really interesting, if you compare the result of this group of the patient with our own result, we can see that we have, we still have mitral regurgitation when we have in that group 200, in our group 204 in uh, diastolic uh, volume, in systolic 151, and we had 144. And if we, if we check the patient which we, we were successful in treat mitral regurgitation only to treat the ventricle, you see that the diastolic volume was 159, exactly the same, and the systolic volume and systolic volume was 110 against 97. So exactly the same volume. I think this is a great demonstration for the fact that the volume of the ventricle, the shape of the ventricle, is a major inducer of recurrence of mitral regurgitation. This is a small example of uh, uh, mm, MRI. You see that this is a huge ventricle, really very huge ventricle with a huge uh, scar. But in this particular patient, because this diameter is still preserved, the mitral valve is working. This is the same patient after the procedure. You see that there is an important reduction in the volume, but the mitral valve is still working because we're working before, in spite of the fact that volume is, is now is a good, uh, in a good situation. This is true also for dilatation of inferolateral uh, dilatation. This is the ventricle that you have a, a, a scar in lateral and inferior portion with uh, a deep tenting area and with important mitral regurgitation. So, theoretically, in this group of the patient, it's possible to resect this scar and to bring this portion, this point, exactly at this point, so I keep together the point B and A and put together the papillary muscle. In this way, we can uh, interact strictly with the mitral regurgitation. And this is the patient that we have seen the MRI, you see there is bad ejection fraction, mitral regurgitation, and dilatation on the inferolateral portion. This is the same patient treated only with exclusion of the scar, and you see that the shape is much, much better. The ejection fraction, because we reduce the wall stress, is increased, and the mitral regurgitation is, 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 is disappear completely. In this particular case, nothing was done on the mitral itself. This is another uh, example of the patient that he got an uh, anterior myocardial infarction with uh, posterior septum involved, as uh, you can see, it doesn't move at all. The anterior portion of the septum that doesn't uh, work at all. The inferior wall that is retracting 
the papillary muscle and we have an important leaking of the mitral valve. So to try to uh, treat this patient, surely something must be done on, on, the, on the annulus of this valve. But if we don't do something on the ventricle, we have high probability to uh, have a recurrence of the, of the mitral regurgitation. And what we have to do to, to this valve? You know that yesterday we spoke about that also. The mitral repair vessel replacement in, this, in these cases is it's, it's very, very uh, controversial issue. This paper shows clearly that there is no differences in terms of uh, overall survival if we repair or if we change the valve. And the only thing that we have by sure that if we repair the valve, the incidence of mitral regurgitation is higher. So this is something that must be kept in, in, in the mind. This is another paper that uh, is uh, compare the result with uh, repair for ischemic mitral regurgitation and uh, valve replacement. Once again, there is no differences. The only difference is that uh, there is a more important recurrence of uh, mitral regurgitation. And this also, it's important to notice that the diameter in this group of the patient were not so big as we can expect. This is a, probably is another thing that it's a, it's a little atonish. And uh, if I have to change a, a mitral valve, which kind of valve I have to do? Uh, there is a, a, a great uh, uh, pushing towards the biological valve. But if you do, if you look this, Show this slide, you see that, of course, patients with uh, mitral plasty are uh, doing better than uh, 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 mitral replacement, but if you uh, uh, dichotomize a patient with a biological valve versus mechanical valve, there is no more difference between mechanical valve and mitral plasty, probably because in the two groups, the mitral recurrence is less in the in, uh, mechanical valve. And this is the last randomized trial that was published, the <coughs> repair versus replacement in severe ischemic mitral regurgitation. is uh, is, is an important trial that is randomized and uh, to shortcut, they demonstrate that there is no difference at one year. So this probably is more complicated field that we can thought. And uh, of course, we have to thinking that the Accomplish of the crime, the primary culprit is the underlying ventricular infarction and adverse remodeling. So we have to think into the ventricle. And when the ventral valve should be uh, changed, probably when the, we are sure that we are not effective to reduce the cavity, or, or we don't know exactly uh, if our uh, uh, surgical procedure will have a good diameter, the valve have to have to change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, comments or questions? It's it's truly disappointing that the mechanical valve is an equally good alternative to to reconstruction. It, it's it's, to it. it's strange, but the data in uh, in, in literature in this case, in this case. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are speaking about patients who have bad ejection fraction, of yes. course that uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction in the past, of course, in, in, in this typology, of course. Uh, Lorenzo, you have shown a case, uh, an anecdotic case, where after a section, or after a restoration of the oil ventricle, the mitral insufficiency disappeared. Now, my precise question is... Uh, it's not anecdotic. Uh, we have 150 cases like that. Uh, no, in which every, in every, uh, in every in case... 50. Uh, uh, half of that, uh, no, no, we not treat the mitral valve. So, uh, I want to ask a precise question. What is the predictability uh, Good. on this precise point? Once uh, you, can, you have a, a dilated ventricle, a ventricle with a scar, how can you say that after restoration, mitral valve uh, will insufficiency keep. will disappear? So the, the, this is very important from the decision making. Um, can can I have the slides, please? Um, 
To try to be as precise as possible, I think the MRI is it's, uh, the fundamental tool. Because if there is a scar in between the, the papillary muscle and you have no big uh, annulus, in this situation, we have the great possibility just to exclude the scar because you reduce your diameters, the valve, the valve will be uh, continent after that. But if the scar is more peripheral, is not in between the papillary muscle and you uh, uh, exclude the scar, the distance of the papillary muscle remain almost the same and diameters of the ventricle remain the same. And your valve we will it must be done something on the valve itself. Uh, of course, when we have doubt, we put the annulus. There, there is no, no question. There is no, absolutely no question about that. So I, I, I show this, this, the, this case that was, was paradigmatic just to try to uh, share this knowledge that uh, a scar in, in, in a certain position is responsible for mitral regurgitation. You never tried uh, assessing a left ventricular volume with a balloon after making oh, a ventricular yeah. repair <laughs> and then decide if, depending on the volume, if there is a sense of replacing the valve or repairing it. Uh, they have a special, you know. Uh, we, we assess the volume in all the ventricles, but unfortunately, when we have a dilatation of the basal portion of the ventricle, uh, the, the balloon, the size is not so precise because it cannot predict the, the, the dimension of transverse diameter. Yeah. So, uh, um, to uh, depend totally from the volume for the uh, function of the mitral valve can be wrong. So, uh, in that particular situation, we know exactly because the volume is, is considered, but we, we consider also, and this is very important, the diameters of the, of, the, of the valve. If the diameters is bigger than normal, we do, we perform always a, a, a ring. And it can be performed from the ventricle, from the atrium, it depends on uh, how is, is uh, the volume of the ventricle. Lorenzo, I really enjoyed that, and it's a frustrating area of uh, research and uh, also the things that you've discussed, including the papers we've uh, produced from the Cleveland Clinic. I, I think one take on the NIH study is to remember that we don't have an effective repair. So to randomize patients where you don't have an effective repair with a high failure rate probably was a bit early to do. Yeah. And I, I think the other point about the repairs was that a lot of these patients developed what was really posterior kind of aneurysms, and it's not clear entirely why that happened, whether you know, the circumflex was knocked off or something like that. Uh, one of the things that I've had a frustrating time with is we've been working on a spacer. Um, Soren, actually, as you may know, has now bought out the, the research and is going to take it further. And we put a, a transapical spacer into the mitral valve. And in the, uh, one of the patients we did with John Webb in Vancouver, which was, was fascinating, is that it, uh, we did a transapical aortic valve and then put the spacer in. It improved the cardiac function and it uh, improved the cardiac index and the injection fraction improved also because what happens is now you're not only fixing the leakage but because it's transapical, it's anchored on the apex and there's tremendous pull in a sense into the atrium from the left ventricle and so you improve the ejection fraction also. So, I think we were a bit early on the NIH study, but I think we've got other potential things that we need to work on. Uh, some of the other technologies to try and improve the ejection fraction and fix the MR. And eventually, I think what we're going to get to is a combination of techniques of course. where we can combine improving ejection fraction and the regurg. Any comments about the slings um, on the papillary muscles? I've done a few. I'm not convinced uh, it's uh, God's gift. I, I try in a very few cases yeah. to, to put a, a sling, but I, I was disappointed because I think that it's more complicated because with the sling, you put together the papillary muscle. Yeah. The problem is that in this particular case, the papillary mass, the distance between the papillary muscle and the annulus, it's bigger than normal. And if you put together 
the, the distance right. remain remain the same. So the posterior leaflet is, is a retract also. And another thing that I have to do, uh, probably uh, Ottavio can can help us. If we put a, a, a small uh, rings, we see sometimes that the leaflets go deeper in in the cavity. Yeah. We do like that, and the posterior leaflet that was working more or less is working in zero in zero in zero condition. So, uh, of course, to try to, to put together different uh, technologies is, is the key. For this reason, when we do uh, restoration and we know that the basal portion is, is bigger, we, we put our always an annulus also. And when really the deep of the tenting area, it's really very, very important. Probably we prefer to change the valve at this moment. It's something new for us also. But the result that we see, we have seen has, uh, in, are in that direction, and of so course you keep all the cordae on the papillary muscle. So when you replace the valve, have you tried really shortening the the cord yes. and hitching yeah. it higher up? Yes, and yes. I mean I, I don't know, but my my feeling is that if you can then yes. now in a sense pull those cordae up. You may improve ventricular function long If you keep everything, you go open. Yesterday, somebody showed the, the techniques. If you, you, you keep in the middle the mitral valve, and after that, you roll over yeah. the two leaflets. The cordae are, are, are shortening in a very important way. Have you studied that? No, not yet. Yeah. I think that may be one thing. Yeah, I, I think you just answered my question because I had the same question about you talk about the three distances those the right, distance correct. between the pap muscles the distance from the tip of the pap muscles to the mitral annulus and then the size of the annulus but it seems to me that uh, in, in these procedures and I've heard you give this talk before or a, a type of it before and I always enjoy it and always learn something but I always have the same question and that is uh, what uh, uh, was just mentioned uh, by Lars, that it seems to me that one of the most important principles of ventricular reconstruction is not only to bring the size and shape and all those things back, but it's to reestablish the fixed distance between the tip of the papillary muscles and the uh, mitral annulus. You know, Greg Miller showed us years ago that throughout the cardiac cycle, the distance between the tips of the papillary muscles and the mitral annulus are exactly the same. They don't change. So I've often wondered in patients like this if we were going to, uh, to compare uh, repairs, as, as, uh, as uh, Marco said earlier, if, you repair, if you're comparing repairs to uh, mitral valve replacement, then you're assuming that you're doing the optimal repair, which I'm sure you are. But I think in and some of those uh, RCTs, that was not the case. Uh, it seems to me that uh, I've done a, not as many door procedures as you have, but a lot of them. And uh, I was, I, the fir one of the first things that, uh, that impressed me was that the ventricle seems to move like this now against its horizontal axis, right. which is really the uh, mitral annulus. But in order for the ventricle to twist, it has to have a vertical axis around which to twist. To twist, And I think that vertical axis is from the mitral annulus through the cords, through the pap muscles to the outside of the ventricle. And it seems to me that less emphasis has been placed on reestablishing that vertical axis over the years. Um, but I think we're all sort of talking about the same thing. But I'd, I'd like your opinion as to how important you think that is in comparison to the size of the annulus, the other two measurements that you mentioned. Uh, you are perfectly right. The problem is uh, that uh, to be successful in, in, uh, uh, in obtaining this goal is depend very much from the anatomy that we have and how long is the posterior wall that it's, it's working. That this is the problem. Because if the, the, the scar is start at the base of the papillary muscle, it's very difficult to achieve this type of, of anatomical situation. So we have uh, like to be in, in, in a, uh, an easy equilibrium between what you said and what we find by, by anatomical uh, situation. 